All right, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, here we are. And uh, yes, once again, we, well, I don't know if we're going to, are we going to do this one first or second or how are we going to do that? Yes. Yes. Well, we got, we got two special guests for you guys today. We've got the original gangster himself, the OG, Mike Deddy. Uh, if you don't know who he is, you're wrong, but you can fix yourself. Uh, and we also are going to have Michael Bain, who's a different kind of OG. He's an OG in his own right. Uh, and you guys are in for a treat and we are at the, uh, well, we're not there now. We're, we're in a hotel somewhere, but we're out in Arizona where it's not sunny despite the, uh, the lies that they tell in the, in the, uh, recruiting brochures, the tourist brochures say that it's the sunniest place on earth. And I'm, I'm not really seeing that right now, but, uh, here we are getting ready and, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're doing the like bros podcast where we go out, have dinner, do some drinks, and then come in and record. We don't normally do that. That's not how we normally do it. We're normally very professional, Mike. I don't think either of us drink, so that would be a problem. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I definitely don't. So, <laughs> I'll drink enough for both of you guys. It's fine. <laughs> but here we I'm are. I'm the president of my fraternity. Pater- your paternity? You're paternity. the president of your paternity? Yeah. You, okay. Tap a keg of brew. Yeah. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to pause and let Zach play the intro music in three, two, one. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up to your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All right, I want to go ahead and just knock this out, because this is going to be an unusual episode. We're obviously on the road, we're traveling, we're recording interviews with people, and I'm going to thank... Those who support us, and that would be obviously Duracoat Firearm Finishes. Duracoat, uh, the professional's choice. Everything else is crap. Um, we've got cra- <laughs> that's not their official slogan. <laughs> I, 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 calm down. The people in, in the Duracoat facility are listening right now, and they're they're, they're, they're face palmed. They're, they're face palming. And they're like, Amy's like, did he just say everything else is crap? I mean, it's true, but we don't we don't say it publicly. It's it's very true. In fact, you converted me from being a Krylon guy to Duracoat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, crossbreed holsters. Well, we have witnesses. Yeah, we have because everyone needs to be dangerous on demand. Uh, get your butts over to crossbreedholsters.com. Use the promotional code SOTG. Save some money on a high-quality American-made holster. You can and you should do that, indeed. Brownells at brownells.com. Brownells, they're righteous dudes. Uh, we've been talking about them a lot lately. Check out their brand-new website. They put a lot of time, effort, and money into improving their website. And if you don't go over there and you don't check it out, then they wasted their time. So stop wasting their time. Go to brownells.com right now. Well, I mean, you can wait until you're not listening to the show anymore. Or you can just hit pause and go to Brownells and buy something. No, no, back. no. I don't, don't, I don't do not tell them to pause the show. Okay. you got to keep listening. Okay. Open up your browser. Uh, yeah, open there. up your browser. That's true. You can listen. Yeah. Open, you can browse and shop at Brownells at the same time. Just do Just not multitask. Well, this is a family friendly hour, so yeah. I won't say that. You're nice. Uh, you want a the the most affordable ten millimeter pistol that there is in existence? It is the gateway nope. drug to the ten millimeter. I want to pay extra. Mike, do you know what the gateway drug to the ten millimeter pistol is? It's the champagne of pistols. It's the champagne of pistols. High point. High point. That's right. The JXP ten witnesses is a a single stack single column. 10 mil, it uses the same magazine as their 10 millimeter carbine. Holds 10 rounds of 10 millimeter. It is the gateway drug. If you've been wanting to uh, try out a 10 millimeter, you think, oh man, I can't afford thousand dollars for a pistol. Ah, but you can get one from them. So check those guys out. They're our bros. You know why? You know what my favorite thing about the High Point brand is? What the haters the talk haters. about it so much. Yeah, I was on one of the social media things the other day, and I saw a meme, what? and it. 
and I didn't see any words on it. All I saw was a brick with a wooden pistol frame. And I was like, I already know. I already know what this is going to say. <laughs> and and then I, I scrolled down a little bit more and it said like something about high point. And I was like, ah, they have an awesome brand because oh, the haters man. talk about it even more than the people that love it. They're like, they're like the Howard Stern of, it's like, you know, Howard Stern, the people who hate Howard Stern spend more time listening to him than the people who like him because they're trying to catch him trying to saying something. Oh, uh, who else should we thank? Mike Deddy. We can thank Mike Deddy. This show yeah. is brought to you by, in part by Mike Deddy. It's brought to you by the letter M. Yeah. Actually, it's brought to you the, by the letter O and the letter G. G. O G. That's right, the original and, gangs. Uh, while we're on G, let's thank Gunsight for letting us come back oh, once again. Yeah, oh, yeah, they, they, they screwed up. And they left the gate open, and we got in. <laughs> they're like, well, we left the gate open, and they got in. We might as well let them stay. You know what? Uh, what I like to say is every trip to gun sites like coming home um, because that's a place where you find like-minded people with like-minded mindsets that, can, that are happy to share their knowledge and experience with you, uh, understanding that you're going to be uh, very open to what they're teaching. Good people. Yeah. So this is my first time here. Yes, this is Jared's really? first yeah. time ever. Wow. At yeah. it's, so the only one that's left out of the big training schools for me is Thunder Ranch. Mm. It was Gunsight and Thunder Ranch are the two last ones that I haven't been to. And now I've well, been to you, Gunsight. You, you haven't been to the that one place in Nevada. Well, like you can't go there anymore. <laughs> no, I, was that a big school? I mean... Um, well, it's like it was like a time. Well, that's like saying is McDonald's you know. a big restaurant? Yeah, is true. McDonald's a big restaurant? You know I what, can't, uh, I'm not even sure what they're. I understand they've been sold. I, that's what I heard. Someone bought them. I heard an investor came in and purchased them. I, I hope so. the uh, The original intent of that place was to be a community, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, right. with training facilities, and again, like on site, like minded people, right. where uh, you know you could build a house and enjoy your neighbors and be safe. Great idea. Um, I think the problem probably laid in the in the timeshare pyramid style financing yeah. of all of that, in that you would pay for a bunch of courses ahead of time, give them your money, and then take these courses sometime in the future. So, yeah. um, well, let, let's face facts. That person looked at what Cooper was doing in Arizona, and basically, no doubt. He was he was sitting behind him in class, and he's like, "What's he doing over there?" Yeah. <laughs> first family, yes, that's what we'll call them, the first family. Uh, but so, anyway, so gun sight now. I don't know what it was like in the beginning because I wasn't here. You weren't here in the beginning of gun no. Sight? I was not here in the beginning of gun sight. Well, that's crazy. However, now I was alive then. There's three thousand two hundred plus acres, acres of yes. liberty and freedom at this place. I believe. Yeah. I believe when. Uh, when Buzz purchased it, it had, was like six hundred acres. If I, I believe I, it was around six hundred. I, I think you're you're probably right. Buzz yeah. has done tremendous. Yeah. Buzz Buzz actually saved. Gun oh yeah, sight. Uh, Owen Buzz Mills. You can look him up and Google him if you want. He's a, a super person nice of, dude. Person of note. Uh, yeah, he's a fantastic human being. Uh, he saved this. It would not exist today uh, were it not for him. He stepped in. Um, because Jeff needed, well, he wanted to retire. He needed to retire. Jeff, Jeff was a World War II veteran, and he yeah. was long in the tooth, man. Um, and it was time for him to retire. Uh, not, not only did he did he step in and make improvements that he needed to get government contracts and so forth and grow the place, but after Jeff passed, he allowed Janelle to stay in the house mm-hmm. and uh, be unmolested by whatever events were going on in the world and around the ranges at that time. And... Uh, uh, to live life as she knew it, yeah, and uh, until her last days. So good guy, uh, former Marine also, absolutely, and uh, he's got nothing but my respect for what he's done for Gunsight. I'm one of the. You talk about OGs. My first trip to Gunsight was 1981, college spring break. My friends went to Mexico. I went to Gunsight. Clint Smith was the head instructor at that time. Sweet Buddha. And Jeff was still teaching some of the classroom stuff. Oh, man. I bet that was awesome. Yeah. That's crazy. 1980 and what? 1981. 1981. Damn, son. I was in high school. They're, they did a song about that yeah. year, didn't they? Yeah. No, 85. 1985. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, interesting uh, tidbit. 
For those of you uh, who don't know, uh, when Jeff Cooper started the American Pistol Institute and he created this this facility called Gunsight, uh, he built a home on the property, and his his vision was to create a home that was also a castle that was what he called he called it the sconce, right? Yeah, the sconce, and like uh, a it, it's wall lamp. It's a very no, it's a very unique home. It's a very unique architecture, and uh, well, it's still there and it remains today. And what they've done since since both Mister Cooper, Mister and Missus Cooper have passed away, and they've gone to their great reward, uh, and the kids don't want to live here, um, so it is now actually a museum. It is actually, right. and when you come here to take a the the introductory course, the number one course um, for Gunsight is the two hundred and fifty. It's the handgun course. It's the uh, it's Friday through Sunday, right? Generally, a Friday through Sunday. I think you come in on Friday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Am I correct? The two fifty is uh, Monday through Friday, I believe. Oh, is it that long? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you, you don't you don't get to go to any advanced classes until you have graduated from that two fifty. It's the, it's the building block. Yes, yeah, the building. And block they they don't the care way. if you come from special forces or. Your grandmaster USPSA comp competitor. What if you you start with a two fifty class? A, a, a purple belt and Krav Maga. You'll start two fifty. I, th- I think they yeah. might make an exception though. I don't know. Okay, we'll we'll have to talk about that later. But my point is this: <laughs> what it would be uh, the the house when people come for the two fifty and they become a fa- gunsight family member. One of the one of the perks is you get to go to Jeff's house, right? And you get the tour of the house. That was a tradition Mrs. Cooper started uh, uh, on graduation day after the man on man shoot offs. She would invite the students over for lemonade and brownies, mm. and they would get a chance to see the house. And of course, the house incorporates many things that Cooper picked up in his travels in South oh, yeah. America and Africa. Yeah, That's his, cool. his library's there. Trophies are there. Well, I want to know what his library is. Uh, his, his vault room. room. Yeah, so yeah. it's a thing. And by the way, you, you know, when I took the course in 1981, he, he was talking about things you don't want to put on your 1911s. And he opened a pistol rug, and he pulled out this little MS Safari gun that Safari had sent him without request, hoping to get some kind of mm. play from Mr. Cooper. And he said, this is... This is the answer to a question nobody's ever asked, and it had a full-length guide rod and Smith and Wesson K sights on it, and a hook trigger guard and a finger groove on the front strap. And he says, if you look at this and think this is a crutch for your shooting, you're wrong. And what made me laugh about it was he he picked it up and held it like a rodent that he just pulled out of a mouse trap. <laughs> And he put it back in a pistol rug the same way. And I was telling that story to Ken Campbell a couple of years ago. So when we went over for our tour of the Scots, he said, Daddy, come over here. He goes, is this the gun you were talking about? And that very same MS Safari pistol was sitting on top of the pistol rug that Cooper had showed us back in 1981. Jeez. So he didn't get rid of much, I don't think. But no. uh, it's, hey, it was still there you, in his know. vault. Yeah. Now that that's fantastic. You know what's funny is uh I think it was it was uh James brought that that exact quote up at dinner tonight because we were talking about the US Army and how it's essentially run now by by sycophants and criminals and incompetent boobs and uh how their their decision to purchase equipment for the troops is not based on what's best for the troops, but it's based on how much you know, cocaine and hookers and how many steak dinners they get from people. And, uh, and James said, he goes, he goes, yeah, he's like this new, this MK five MK ultra or whatever. <laughs> this new super battle rifle that that's like 12 and a half pounds empty that they're going to buy for the troops. They're like, Oh, this is, this is the greatest thing ever. And that's the, the, the ballistic firepower of a, what did they say in the article, Jared, a main battle tank. It produces the same energy or force as a main battle tank. This was in like the Army times. I'm like, oh, well, you don't know that it doesn't do that. Yeah, that's true. A six eight could produce the same as a main battle tank. I don't know. I'm Pretty not close, a general. Yeah. Well, it could in the be Army. the amount of pressure that's created in a smaller, 
You know, like if you scale it up, That's then it's like, probably the same, you know, that kind of thing. Or it could be some Lance Corporal going, let's see if they catch this when I push this article through. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it's the Army. You know, it's oh, the right. Army. Yeah, it's the Army specialist. procurement. Yeah, it's some specialists. But anyway, but yeah, James said that. He goes, he goes, he goes, that's what they're doing. He goes, they're, they're, they're providing an answer to a question that was never asked. Yeah. So, uh, you know, speaking of asking questions, there's a lot of stuff that we can ask Mike Deddy about, but I want to start it out with what makes Mike, Mike. My, well, geez, Mike's a simple guy, you know, uh, I like being alone as long as my dog's nearby. I trust him more than I trust most people. Um, I enjoy writing somehow. One of the, one of the benefits from my 12 year marriage was the first year of we were married. My wife came home from the store and caught me reading, uh, the latest edition of American Handgunner and gave me a very dirty look. And I thought, Geez, you know, it's my day off. What the heck? Why can't I read a gun magazine? She said, I don't mind you reading that. She said, but you should be writing for those magazines. And that kind of like lit a flame. And I was like, huh, I wonder if I, I could. Thought about that. And I think maybe three or four months later, I sold an article to another old Marine, uh, Jack Lewis at Gun World. Gun World. If anybody remembers that magazine. And uh, that was the start. And two or three years later, uh, I happened to hit Harry Kane up at the right time. I had a gun yeah. and an article that he needed, which was the new Kimber custom classic i think they called it which was really the first 1911 you could buy that had a beaver tail extended safety and low profile combat sights on it without taking a colt or a springfield armory to a gunsmith and having them add those items to it and that that's how i started with harris publication what, what year would that have been that was 1993 oh dude we started the exact same time yeah this I, is our thirtieth year. I started selling my articles in ninety three too. Yeah. Also, in yeah. in addition, Jared, would you do me a super big favor? Would you walk over there and get that water that I forgot to bring over here? I uh, can do that for you. The, the you, trick to this is he's wearing first. six inch stilettos. <laughs> oh my gosh! You should see don't it. Don't twice. Don't twist that ankle, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> I'll walk slowly. Uh, and you know, I always like to tell the story. Uh, old Harris Publications. Our first editor there was a guy named Harry Kane, and I didn't know much about Harry. Uh, and he came across as gruff. And actually, my first two phone calls to him for queries, he hung up on me. Third time I called, I had that article on a Kimber, and he asked me to fax it to him. And then he said, "You know what, kid? Uh, this is a very small club. We we're very careful about the people we let in to be contributors. Mm -hmm. said, but what else do you have?" And I ended up selling him the first two articles that he hung up on me when I called. So a good guy. Only find out much later from people not himself. Mm -hmm. Harry was an ex special forces guy. He was a who was the real poop he in, was the, in he Nam. Was, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was sitting at work one day in Tucson, Pima County, and Harry called and he said, "Mike, uh, can you get in your phone book? This is pre computer now." Can you get in the, in the blue pages of your phone book and find me the number for the Pima County um, prosecutor? Sure. Um, what's going on? That's kind of an odd request. He goes, ah, oh, well, when I was out at Evergreen, I killed a guy in a bar fight, and somehow it's still on my record. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> And, uh, and, 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 and it, it, Harry was one of those guys. You didn't push him for more details. Yeah, you're like, oh, know. well, there. Ah, well, that that explains right. it. Okay, cool. here's the number. Yeah, here's here's the cool. That's cool. Man. Yeah, uh, and uh, he was he was a uh, well, he's one of those guys who learned how to be a ghost because when he decided he was going to retire, poof. Yeah, he ghosted. You know, I know somebody that stayed in touch with him. Although the last time I asked. They said his number had been discontinued. So Harry would be up in years. Uh, it would not. I'd find it hard to believe that he is still actually alive, but just a tremendous character. Yeah. Yeah. He was a fantastic guy. And, uh, well, you know, it, we, we were, I was talking to, I was talking with Bain about, uh, we, when we were talking about editors and, and even tonight when we were in the car, we were talking about, 
you know, I was talking to, to my friend Bob and uh, he was talking about, uh, you know, how you, like you said, get in the club. You see, people today don't understand. They're like, well, why got, I, you know, there's no club. You you get a YouTube channel or a TikTok channel or whatever and you, you, you put a wig on your head and jump around like a freaking <laughs> lunatic and blah, 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 blah. You get a freaking, a viral video and then people pay attention to you. That's that's not the way the world used to be. No. The way the world used to be is there were people at the top that vetted you. If you don't know what the word vet means, you need to it doesn't mean people work on poodles. Uh, like they the people that went to like war and stuff. Yeah. Not not even those. No. no, they vetted you. And you didn't get to become a anything. Whether it was television, whether it was radio, whether it was writing, you didn't just walk in and they're like, "Oh, cool, man. You got purple hair. Let's make you a freaking bara." No. And they would give you a small thing and they would and they would give you an assignment and see if you would finish the assignment. Right. And then if you did, they're like, "Okay, it's it's like the like the the the, the tale in uh, uh that Jesus tells in the Bible about the talents. Like, you know, he would give the, the one guy got that, and he's like, okay, now you get more. You took you, you had two talents. You took you produced this. Now you'll get more responsibility. And it was the exact same thing. You know, when when I was, I learned to query people. I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book or read a book. I read a book back then, and it was like how to get published. It's, it's an art form. It's like the way kids put together their uh, LinkedIn page or their uh, – their resume now mm-hmm. you had to know all the right buzzwords and so forth but in the old days when you and me started and you had to send in floppy disks and slide film mm-hmm. and, and a black and white contact sheet because nothing was digital then yeah and maybe you would get those materials back from that guy you sent it to and probably most you likely wouldn't. you wouldn't yeah. um that's how you sent out a query yeah. and if you didn't have a letter that got their attention Right off the bat, I'll guarantee you, you would never hear from this, sir or madam. Yeah. That's yeah. why there are so many risque pictures of Mike Deddy out there. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to, he was trying oh my to, gosh, that's he was genius. genius. He yeah. was hustling, man. That was He's, the pattern interrupt you, you before had, the pattern interrupt was yeah, popular. You had to hustle. No, but, but my story was, my story it was, a, it was a story of threes. Real quick before you go on yep. that. I just want to let you know that I walked all the way downstairs in my six inch stilettos to get you those waters. Oh, God bless you. You're welcome. Yeah. No, you, I, you sure you didn't dip them out of the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> uh, it tastes the same. But uh, no, I wrote I wrote three letters to the editor, I, and it was this was right when the Clinton was jabbering on about assault weapons bans. Sure. And so I wrote what I thought was was very articulate well-written letters to the editor. I sent one to gun world. I sent one to uh, guns and ammo magazine, and I sent one to Harris. I don't remember which one it was combat or something like that. And, uh, a uh, guns, uh, guns and ammo published it and gun world published it. Nice. And was, what was really cool is they published it. Guns and ammo published my letter to the editor on the facing page to Cooper's, um, Cooper had written a letter to the editor about Richard G and oh, about how he was, he was, he was, he, remember he referred to as, as his time in exile. Yes. As the he time wasn't in, allowed under angels. As his yeah. time in exile, right? Whoa, he was for the audience and me. Who is Richard G. All right. When Jeff got old, he was up in years and he, he knew he needed to retire. He couldn't run the day to day of gunsight anymore. I mean, cause when he started, he was it, he was the guy, yep. you know, and he knew he couldn't do that anymore. So he started looking for people in this. Yeah. And G was a doctor, right? Was he a chiropractor or a doctor or something? You know, I, I don't I'm, remember. I'm not sure. It, it I, seems to I, me I, in my mind that he was like something like that. During his years, I was not up here. I was in the Marines and doing other things. Yeah. And so I wasn't here to witness any of that. I but didn't I, come back till Buzz got the place. Yeah. So, uh, but um, Jeff wrote... He wrote a letter, and they published it in Guns and Ammo. It was right next to mine, and that was like my, my first oh, nice. brush with greatness, you know. And he's like, contrary to popular belief, we are not welcome on the ranges at Gunsight, and we because because Cooper always spoke of himself in the third person when he sure. was writing. Uh, so anyway, so that was the threes. So I sent out three letters to the editor. 
and and uh, two of the three got published. And I was like, oh, holy cow, cow I got all excited. And, was, you know, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to write. So I wrote three separate articles, and I fired them off to three separate magazines. I sent one to Black Belt Magazine uh, about bodyguarding, because I was bodyguarding at the time. Nice. And I sent another one to Harry, and I sent another one to somewhere else. I can't remember where it was. Harry was who? Harry Kane, the Harry editor Kane. at Paris. So, yes. in what magazine would that have been? It, well, it would have been either Guns and Weapons or Combat Handguns. Combat Handguns. Those are the big ones, or yeah. the Gun Annuals and stuff. You know, complete book of guns. You know. I just want to make sure I pull that out for yeah the people listening. So, the phone rings, and and it's Harry King. No kid. Yeah, he said. He said. And I said hello, you know, and he's like, "This is Harry King with Harris Publications." I speak to Paul Markle, and it's like, "Oh, hey, this is Paul Markle." And he's like, yeah, I got your, uh, I got your article here. He's, it's interesting. Tell me a little about your help. So I, you know, I gave him my background. He's like, hmm, okay. Uh, and he said, well, could you give me an article about this and this? And I said, yes. He's like, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and pay you for this one. We'll publish it, and then I need you to do this and this. Let me know. All right. I'm like, okay, bam, and that was it. Yeah. He was very brief. Yeah. And uh, I, I told the thing with, with Michael he had about sh- stuff to do. Uh, yeah, he had stuff to do, man. And then, uh, so, and the funny thing is, the Black Belt article, they didn't call me, but they sent me a letter thanking me for the submission, telling me they were going to publish it, and but telling me that they needed additional photography. And they said, this is what we need to go with it. And I was like, oh, I was super excited. Now I got two potential ones. So uh, uh, at the time, I was working as a professional bodyguard. And, uh, um, we had an FBO in Florida, in Sarasota, where I was in Sarasota, Florida, uh, and we knew the the guys, and they had a, they had a leer out on the on the runway, and so my buddy and I got in our suits, and we got a professional photographer, and we went out, and uh, we did a bunch of stage stuff around this leer, and uh, the the photo still exists, you yeah. Know, the the original bodyguard the black photo. suit, yeah, the original yeah. bodyguard one where I'm in front of the leer and I'm doing that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. We print them up. We get nice black and white prints because that's what they wanted at the time. They right. wanted black and white prints. I send them the prints. These caca eaters didn't use them. They put in some garbage photos that they'd already run in previous magazines, oh, no. paid me 150 bucks for the article, and sent me a free copy of the magazine. I was like, okay. What did that photo shoot cost you? Actually, it didn't cost me anything because I, uh, the guy was a, a friend, and I submitted the photos with photo credit by gotcha. John Jones, uh, right? So they didn't publish the photos. Was he mad? Credit John Jones. Well, he was like, well, we tried. and yeah. Listen, if, you, if you're a wannabe writer... This stuff happens all the time. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, fornicate those dudes over at Black Belt Magazine. Those are some clowns. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't Black Belt Magazine printed on newsprint? Maybe I'm thinking of Boxing World. No, no, it was. It was printed printed on. Was it nice? It was Boxing World that you're thinking of. I've seen the old. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it yeah, looks like the comic he, section yes, of Sunday yes, papers. Yeah. It's that bad. No, Black Belt was actually <laughs> glossy, and it was, was nice. It? At the time, it was owned by, like, sunshine publications or something it's probably changed hands three times since then but uh even if it still exists i don't even know if it still exists but uh, so that was my, my my story of threes so i sent out three letters to the editor two of the three got published i sent out three articles two of the three articles got published and then harry's like okay i need it i need this and i need this and so the first year i had like six articles published in my first year and i was like Wow. Nice. This is crazy. Nice. And it wasn't until years later that I realized that no one in the world knows who writes the articles that they read. I can get a one year <laughs> subscription to Black Belt magazine for thirty four ninety nine right now. Oh well it still exists. Yeah, there you go. So You know who that is? Is it uh, one of the Gracies? I can't tell. No, that's Tim Kennedy. Oh, oh. Yeah, what's he doing? It didn't look like him, but it, it is. Oh, he's he's doing things. Oh, good for him. Bless his heart. So, uh, have you written any more books? Do you no. have any more books in the works? I do. You know, you you do being a gangster, or I you? Do. I it's, 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 it's got it's got nothing to do with my prior life as a gun dealer, or undercover 
operative Not, for the yeah we didn't yeah. get very far for the into AFT. what makes Mike Mike yeah so um, uh, the next book is about dogs and my vision of heaven and and where we're all going to end up and uh, the hard part about right is I mean everybody thinks they have the world's greatest dog and that old saying is everybody's right you know you, you yeah. do have the best dog and and they all are therapy dogs. Um, but I've had some really special ones over the years, some a little more special than the others. Some had talents, the other didn't, some were smarter, some were more athletic. They each had their special points. Uh, but gosh, I miss them all when they leave. Mm. And it's, it's the hardest thing to get over. And the only thing you can really do to get over it is to find another, great find dog another one <laughs> or yeah, that's terrible. find that's an true. average dog and make him great, which yeah. they have a, a real talent for doing on their own based on, what they see you needing from them. I mean, mm. that's, that's their talent is figuring out how to make you happy. And when they don't, they get really disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. I know my wife, she's like, you know, we, we've had dogs our whole, basically our whole married life now, you know, and when we lose one and one gets old or whatever, and she's like, I don't know if I want to do that again. And yeah, but yeah, we have another dog. Of course, of course you do. <laughs> yeah. Just a little, little, little story about the hers. When we got married, she did not want a dog. She didn't like dogs because when she was a kid, she got bit by a dog. Her family wasn't a dog family, so mm -hmm. they never had one as pets. Makes sense. And she got gotten bit by one, so she's like, "I don't like dogs. I don't want to have a dog." Blah blah blah. Well, time goes by. You have little kids, and little kids tend to be magnets for for puppies and stuff like. And we ended up dog. She's the dog queen, okay? <laughs> All the dogs we've ever had, if she's in the house, they ignore me completely. Oh, yeah. The only time they want to be around me is like, oh, well, the woman's not here, so I guess you are. I, so, I'm I'm betting it is your wife that feeds them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Food well, stores. she I mean, she's, like, she's, cooks them she, meals that, she's, on the She makes them special, kind of yeah. nice. special food, you know. Dogs eat better than me. Nice. Oh, that's nice. not true. That's not true. You get the point. Yeah, but oh, Zach, if you're listening to this, so Zach is a uh, he's a budding entrepreneur and he's a very hardworking guy, and so uh, he's decided to to come up with his own like natural dog food kind of a no concoction kind of a thing, you know. Uh -huh. So I, he went to the store and he got I don't know, chicken livers or whatever he did, but um, it looks like yellow soup. You know, when you're done. So basically what you do is you add it's it. It's a to, great curry. You, you, yeah, it's like, it looks like curry, but it's for dogs. And you mix it with dry food, and the dogs are just like, blah, 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 and they just great, dive into it like crazy. Great idea. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's it's not a standalone, but if you're like, we, we you know, like you got dry, do dry dog food, and the dog's like, mm, I don't know. Yeah, it's got to get boring. Yeah, so you mix that in there, and so, yeah. Uh, lately, for Gunner, uh, uh he discovered he likes flour tortillas. Oh, 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 oh. he likes flour tortillas. Man. He gets he gets kibble, Yay. but he also gets a big butt flour tortilla torn up in little pieces and mixed in with his kibble. So <laughs> that makes his tail wag. <laughs> it's it's interesting that you have a dog named Gunner because we have a good friend who has a dog named Gunner also in you Wyoming. Know, I didn't realize how common it was till I named him that, and everybody's like, "Oh, you're a gun guy." So f figures. Actually, a tribute to my dad, who was a warrant officer, mm -hmm. Marine in World War II. Gunner is and, uh, yep. Gunner is Marine slang for World warrant War officer. officer. Yep. And uh, so that's that's where his his name came from. But people go, oh, because you're yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay, it's easy to say. Well, yeah, our our yeah, fr yeah, our friend yeah, exactly. is actually, our friend who has a gunner dog is actually a uh, he's a hunting guide. Oh, he's a professional hunting. Makes guide, sense. So. What what breed of dog? Uh, is a, he's a, he, no, he's a lab. lab. No, he's a lab. He's a retriever. Which dog? Uh, who? Dave's dog, Gunner. Oh, the black one. Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The one who's not supposed to. Yeah. Get, don't and don't tell Dave. Dave doesn't listen to the show. So until you do, he's this a yeah. yeah. Dave, our friend Dave's like he tells Nancy he's he's on the ranch, you know. So they bring Gunner into the ranch and where Nancy's cooking. She's the cook on the ranch, yeah. and Nancy and Gunner loves Nancy. <laughs> um, and Dave's like, don't give him any treats. He's a He's a working dog. He doesn't get treats. And okay. he's like, mm. Nancy's like, okay. <laughs> as soon as Dave leaves, she's like, come here, Gunner, sit down. 
sit. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he's re- Gunner's retired now, though. He's re- he's retired from the retrieving thing. He's well, he's my older. my Gunner is a chocolate lab, and he's he's about a hundred pounds. He could shave a few, but uh, the son of a gun. You, you know, I I had both my ankles replaced in two thousand and ten, so running was something that I never envisioned in my future. Mm. And uh, this darn dog gets me out of bed. We go three miles in the uh, in the washes, which if you're not from Arizona and don't know what a wash is, it's a river but without the water. Yeah. Until it rains really hard for three or four days in a row, and then it becomes a river. But any other time of the year, it's just sand, mm-hmm. like on the beach. So we do, well, we go down a, a hard-packed trail to the wash and then follow it out around back to my house so that's about two miles in soft sand running in boots my homeboy's running i usually don't run unless somebody's chasing me it's not not the same kind of running i did when i was 24 no you know it's not like i'm running the oak course again Mm. but i'm 64 i thought i bet nobody in my high school class can do this anymore that's right man that's right no i i've I've decided that you know I'm I'm not going to become the fat old guy because it's a cliche. You don't have an ounce of fat on you. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. You've, you, I mean, I've known you for a lot of years. You look the best I've ever seen right now. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I've been working deal with my, my coaches. You hear that, Graham? Uh, <laughs> you hear that, Matt? Very. I've been I've been working diligently. I moved the steel, brother. I've seen you. I've, I've moved, seen you. I and I, I, I got to tell you, I, it's been either three or four, probably four years now, you sent me the the book about your cancer recovery. And I have to tell you, I read that on my way to Cabo San Lucas. It's a short book. You can mm-hmm. read it in about two hours. And I did. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I bought a first class seat. So there was nobody sitting next to me. But I, I was weeping as I read that. And man, if you've had a good friend that's gone through something like this, that book will move you to tears. Honestly, did. Dude, y- your mom and I had a conversation the other day. Um, she didn't tell me this when it was going on, but remember when I got put in the hospital? She, she, was, she was telling me, she's like, there was a time, first couple of days, where it was touch and go, and she didn't know if I was going to be coming out. That's yeah. why she wouldn't leave. She didn't. Yep. That woman didn't leave that room. Like she stayed at the hospital nonstop for oh, like over a week. Yeah. Um, man, because she said, she goes, I know what happens. She goes, people are alone and they're like, I'm, I'm alone. And so it won't bother anybody and I can check out. I can go. She's like, I wasn't going to leave you alone for you to check out. Wow. So, um, and the first few days I was in the hospital, you're not usually supposed to go to the hospital, but I was so, messed up that I couldn't not be because I couldn't consume anything. I couldn't drink water. I couldn't get anything in and, and I was in incredible amounts of pain. And, uh, I, so I was like in and out of it. Right. Like for a couple of days, you know, they, they gave me all this stuff and so I, I was like conscious and then I was like gone and stuff. And I would come out and I told her that there was a man a tall man in, in dressed in black standing in the corner. I was like, who was in the, who was in the room? She's like, what are you talking about? There's nobody in the room. I said, no, there was a man standing in the corner, like a man dressed in black standing in the corner. And then I said, and a pilot came in the room and I said, there was a pilot standing at the foot of the bed. She's like, <laughs> she's like, okay. You're losing your mind. They need to adjust your meds because you're losing your mind because nobody's been in this room. And, I, and so I, you know, but like I said, this is the first couple of days. So I was like in and out, in and out. And then, then I, you know, evened out and didn't die. You're like, but did you die? No. But uh, that could have been the Reaper and we the were, driver. We were talking and she's, and we were talking actually the other day, it was your mom and I were in the truck and she goes, she said, she goes, I never say anything to the kids. She didn't tell the kids. She, she wouldn't let us come to the room. She said, I didn't tell the kids how close to, like, checking out you were. And uh, 
I said, I said, you remember? She says, you remember when you when you came out like and you were telling me this crazy stuff? Like there's a a man in black standing in the corner of the room, like staring at you and stuff. And I was like, you don't think, right? And she goes, yeah, I do. <laughs> she's like, she's that was the Reaper waiting to see if you were gonna if you're gonna let go if you're gonna let go. So I, but the good news is, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm still here. Yeah. Oh, uh, anyway, if, if, if you haven't read, if you haven't read the book, the title is fighting solves everything. There you go. There's a subtitle that is, uh, destroying, defeating, can- destroying, destroying cancer, cancer with, with, uh, uh, faith, science and, 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 and uh, nutrition. And nutrition. Yeah. So if you have a friend or relative going through that, please do oh buy gosh. that book. Yeah. Please get that book. Please get that book. Man, that, no, that's cool. I didn't know you're going to do that. So Mike Deddy is still writing. Um, what they do for Mike is they go out into the forest and they cut down trees. They, they murder trees and they turn them into paper and then they, they splash ink on them and uh, the ink becomes words and the words are Mike Daddy's articles. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's that's quite what's, a process. <laughs> what's the title of the new book that you're writing? Do you have one yet? Yeah, it, I'm going to call it "Meet Me at the Gates." Meet me at the gates, because okay. that's that's every dog that as I'm holding on to them as they pass. That's the thing I tell them. And if they grew up with another dog, which usually I have dogs in twos, that we talked about this mm-hmm. earlier today. You know, I when when Sway passed away, I said, "Look for Champ. Go look for Champ. He's going to meet you and take you where you need to be, and then you wait for me there." And it's, it's something I, I truly believe. And the way that started was I'd lost a beautiful white lab named Maya, about 130 pounds. Solid I remember. Muscle. Alpha dog. She ruled the roost. Champ was her little brother. Both rescue dogs, both great labs. Did you have her with you during the whole? Yeah. Boy, she. She was your. There were some people yeah. that couldn't get into the house because of her. I'd have to put her outside. Yeah. She had that sense like. She who's knew who's putting out where, who the devil and, was and who's not. Yeah. Anyway, when she, she developed some kind of neurological thing and, and the vet said, well, we can send her to this specialist and that specialist. And I said, you know, yeah, we, we can spend thousands of dollars, but have you ever seen a, a dog that's developed this problem and, and recover? And she said, no. Uh-huh. And I said, well, let's let her have some dignity. And, and we let her go. My mom called me the next day. She found out. And she said, well, I'm really sorry to hear about Maya, but just think, she's with Dad now, and he's treating her really good. You're getting, you're getting, we're getting, we're getting so, the audience is like, <laughs> the audience is running for tissues here, man. The people are always like, what is going on? I'm just, Kevin and, the, and his girls are like, they're all running for tissue and stuff. Oh, man. You're yeah. <laughs> so that's this is what gave me the idea for the book. Now I've had lots of dogs. I think uh, I married when a little late when I was thirty three, and we started with two dogs, and that was nineteen ninety one. And since that time, I'm on my seventh dog mm-hmm. now. Gunner is my seventh dog. I've had him since always labs. Uh, yeah, yeah. We had one mongrel to start off with, and she was a cool dog, and. And one dog I bought that I thought was a lab as a puppy turned out to be a Ridgeback, which is also a very cool desert dog to have. She just didn't like to swim, but I uh. I like to get in the pool with the dogs. And, yeah. and Gunner, when we come home from a run, even when there's snow on the ground, he'll run right, jump right in the pool, cool off, swim circles, and wag his tail and, you know, do his otter imitation. And uh, it makes me laugh, and that's... That's what it's all about. That's, so. that, that's right, man. They, every dog's a therapy dog. Yeah. Unless they're puking on the floor. Gunner, you had when Alex and I came down. That was before we had kids. No, that was right? Champ, actually. That was Champ. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I don't think I've met Gunner. That was before then. you had Gunner, kids. Uh, uh, Champ was blind. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. You know, you do, you, I've had people in my house for like, you know, 24 hours, and you're like, does your dog have a vision problem? And I'm like, yeah, he's completely blind. And they're like, oh, Oh, that makes, <laughs> and now it makes sense. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. He he uh, he developed diabetes and uh, um, got him on ans- insulin right away, and it helped initially, but ended up having to get the really expensive stuff that's uh, 
time delayed or whatever. And it was like 300 bucks a month. And I was picking up at the pharmacy one day and the lady's like, well, here's your medicine, sir. Uh, is your name champ? And I said, that's my dog. <laughs> she said, oh my God, you're spending a lot of money to keep your dog healthy. I said, lady, I, if it was 900 bucks a month, I'd find a way to do it. I mean, that's, yeah. he's a really good dog. Uh, so the last two years of his life, he was totally blind with cataracts and mm. stuff. But uh, Gunner is also a chocolate lab and oh, a little yeah. on the chunky side. Looks just, just like, like him, him now. Oh, okay. And his personality started off very differently. But somehow, like I was saying, you know, the dogs seem to know what they need to provide us with. Mm. His personality is now very much like Champs was before he passed along. Oh, so wow. um, cool dogs. You know, labs are, uh, you know, they're great with kids. I just laugh and laugh and laugh when my grandson comes over and they run up and down the hallway and play fetch and and mm. stuff it's like having another babysitter in the house oh yeah it really is you know great temperaments but you don't want to get on the wrong side because they're they're a big enough dog to do some damage if they think you're you're, you're uh, skulking them out with some ill intent um you'll be on the receiving end so well you know it's it i've always had dogs yeah, you know, I grew up with them. So our family always had a dog or two, you know, in the house. In Detroit, too? Oh, yeah, in Detroit. When, when I was a little kid, uh, you know, we always did. And uh, I, I, it's weird to me if you're like, oh, well, we're not dog people. We don't really like the a dog is such a utilitarian part of your household. You know, it's it's the the therapy thing. It's the babysitter for the kids. It's the, but it's also the, the it's it's the alarm system. It's it's that you don't have to reset, and uh, you know, people are like, oh, what should I do? I'm like, get a freaking dog. You know, I, I tell people like, well, we don't know about guns. I'm like, you then you shouldn't have one. Right. right. Yeah. If you're like, well, we don't know. We're not comfortable around guns. Good. Don't don't get one. Or the ones like, well, we're going to buy one, but we're not going to put bullets in it. <laughs> Like, just just don't buy it. Just just buy a dog. Yeah, yeah. Please, just go buy a big dog. If it, if you're not willing to put time into training, and go get some good training. I mean, good training. Guns don't don't, don't get a gun. Then don't even. Uh, just, if, yeah, if, don't, if you're yeah. not a gun person and you have it, no interest other than that, don't get a gun. Yeah, it does. It we don't. Mike and I don't get any points or money or anything because you went out and bought a gun. We don't need to convince you to buy guns. If you're not comfortable with a gun, don't freaking buy one. And if you're like, if you're one of these, and I've, like I said for years, you probably heard this crap like, oh, well, you know, I do this, but I don't load it, or I just do this. And I'm yeah. like, they're like, just, just, you're fooling yourself. I've got two pieces of advice for the public listeners that are listening right now. If you're curious as to the benefits of owning firearms, email info at studentofthegun.com. <laughs> if you already know the benefits and you've just bought one, go to studentofthegun.com and sign up for seven training tips that could save your life. That's right. It's a completely online course. You take it at your own pace. You can do it from any device. Go there. It's free. Studentofthegun.com, seven training tips. It's not free. It costs your name and your email, which uh, which which is something. It's worth something to you. So Yes, but you still send them a cake on their birthday, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, you know what? Better yet, if you go by Brownells on I eighty, you can get your free cup of coffee. That's right. You say we there sent you, you, and they'll give you a complimentary cup of coffee. That's so right. There's, you know those guys. Those I tell you what, those guys at Brownells. Every time I'm putting together a build in my mind, mm -hmm. they're the first place I go to. And tonight, I actually got an email that said something like. 6.8 PRC how a barreled actions. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> and how much time do you think Mike spent checking it out going, if I bought one of these, I'd only need to buy a chassis and I could put it together myself. You could. So, yeah. Now they're, they're good people. I've, I've known Frank and Pete for 20 years or so a long time. You know You've what? You've been saying that. In, in the old days when, when I would bother Larry Weeks. Yeah, Larry was my oh, dude. Larry suck. was my dude. We talk about him in past tense only because he doesn't work at Brownells anymore. Yeah, he's retired. But he is building all sorts of race cars and he's stuff, a race which car was dude. His, yeah. his, his passion. It yeah. wasn't guns, oddly enough. It was yeah. it was cars. But uh, uh, every time I'd bother him for a part, and then, 
you know, an article would get written and we, we, you know, we're good to the people that take care of us. Mm. And, and Brownells was always very generous. Um, I would get a letter from, from Frank, from Frank saying, Hey, dude. And, uh, although at some point in time, somebody told me that Larry really wrote it and Frank signed it. I don't care. It was nice just to get that recognition from somebody who said, Hey, you did us a solid. We appreciate it. Well, I'll tell you this. He read the articles. I know he did because I was in his office and he had a stack of magazines Is that right? on his desk that they would, they would get them and someone would say, Hey, we were mentioned in this and they would tab it like an assistant would, would, would tab it and they would put it on his desk. And so he would, he would go through it and he would know. Cause like when I saw him and he said, I said, you know, I said, I know you're really busy. And he goes, no, I saw the article and I appreciate it. I was like, nice, dude, you're the freaking, you're the freaking MF CEO of Brownells and you're reading my article about a freaking handgun or rifle or something like what? Thanks. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. It also keeps you honest while you're writing too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, no. I mean, you know, not that you wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, that was, he's like, just so you know, I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching. A, that you bring up another point. There, there are some people in this industry, and I, I'm not trying to throw mud or anything, but most of them seem to be YouTubers who bother these companies for free stuff. Yeah, and then don't do anything to pay for that free stuff. Yeah. Meaning, right. yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna feature you in this YouTube video, blah blah blah. And guess what? They're just out to get free stuff. And there, uh, back in the old days and still today, there's there's gun riders that do that. Word gets around pretty quick in the mm-hmm. industry. I mean, if, if you think the people at Ruger don't talk to the people at SIG that, that talk to the people at Colt, it's a small community. Oh, it is. Very it's tiny. Small. And they constantly go from one company to the next. No, but, but you know, and I would, when, when, you, when I started, I, Walt Rausch was one of my greatest Jim greatest freaking jam. rabbis yeah. and what and i would get in a jam or i would be like am i doing this right or i screwing up or whatever i would call him and i'm like hey what do you think about this and he, and he would shoot it straight and he's like he'd say i'd say this this guy told me this and he's like f that mother effer <laughs> and he's like let me tell you about that mother effer and i was like oh okay um but uh he said don't ever make a promise that you're not in a position to keep Good advice. He did. And I'll tell you guys this. And when people would say to me, you know, I, I would get a, and I, I almost, once I started and got flowing, I would have never write spec pieces. Now, a spec piece is just something you write that's not sold, that you don't know that the editor's going to want it. You're just doing it. Um, but I would tell people, like, like, you know, Harry would be like, all right, I would pitch, you know, I'd pitch ideas. And once email really got going, mm-hmm. I would say, I've got an, I, this is what I've got. This, 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 this. And I get an email back. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, yes, no. I'm like, Roger that. And I'd start working on it. And if somebody would say, well, when's that article going to be out? You know, like a a company. You know, like, well, when's that going to be out? And I would say, I have no control as a writer. Oh, we, we didn't even know what magazine it was going to no, go into. You no, know, you could send it. They're like, he's like, oh, send it to me for combat. And they're like, yeah, that didn't fit. So we stuck it over here or we stuck it over or there. It went in the annual. Yeah, it goes in the in the annual complete book of guns or whatever. You know, you just never knew. And, and I would tell him, like, look, this, this is not a spec piece. This is an assignment. I have an assignment to review this. And, you know, but, and I will, as soon as, it, and, and I would, and I, and I was diligent, you know, for those first several years. And, and even still, though, uh, when something would come out, I would fire off an email. Wanted you to know, January issue of Combat Handguns, you know, featured your rubber, whatever. Sure. Your flashlight, your ammo, your knife, your da 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 da. Different time, you know. And, and still, every once in a while, when I, I contact a company, holster company recently, Oh, uh, we got your email. Um, yeah, that that's a, that's a nice holster, uh, but we don't know who you are. So, um, geez, can can you send us an article or some kind of proof that you're really a writer? And I'm like, sure, I can, just in case your computer doesn't have Google. 
<laughs> you know. <laughs> Can you imagine um, that? But yeah, yeah. I, I, I tell you what. I just, I just got this into proof today. How about I just forward to you? It's a large file because we got, uh, you know, high quality digital photos with it and stuff. So we're going to send it to you via we transfer. But just you know, to ease your mind. And by the way, this is my thirtieth year in my one thousand one hundred and thirty third article or something like that. You know. Yeah, all right, you you are such a saint because at, at by the time I was done writing paper articles, people were like, "Oh, have have you written anything lately?" I'm like, "A, it's not my job for to make you pay attention to the world that you inhabit. It's like you're <laughs> you're the marketing person for a gun company, a gun industry company, and you don't know who the gun industry." writing people are or and then it's like oh well, there's a lot of writers shut up paul you're a mean guy she, no you shut up uh, <laughs> if you're a marketing person in the gun industry back when we were writing really super active in the 90s and 2000s there were six maybe seven editors total that oversaw all of the gun magazines american mm-hmm. handgunner harris swat gun world there was maybe seven Total. If you're a marketing person in the gun industry, you can't keep tabs of seven humans. Yeah. How hard is it? If I say, hey, I've got an assignment for Harris to write an article about this, how hard is it for you to like hit up Harry Kane and say, hey, is Paul Markle legit? And and he's like, "Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yes, why are you bothering me? Don't you have Google? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you know i i was trying to put myself maybe in maybe they came from another industry or maybe they got moved up to marketing from shipping department or something mm-hmm. but you know sometimes i'm watching the news and i hear somebody's name mentioned i'll just google the name and yeah here's what they're talking about it was a murder or it's a, you know a porn star extorting an ex-president or who knows um but that's how easy it is. I mean, yeah, it's guys, like, you can you can do it. You let can me do Google, it on your phone. Let me now. Google that for you. But that that should be the first thing before you send back a, an email. So but yeah, oh. like before you formulated an email, like, well, I don't know who you are. Have you written anything lately? Like, I saw this, this, and this. What's your recent works? What what like, what have your recent works been? Or you could go, Paul Markle, enter. Oh, well, look at that. Wow. Why is wow. a dentist writing about Why guns? is it? You know, there's three in the world. One's a dentist. One's a, a college professor at Minot State University in North Dakota. Huh. M-I-N-O-T, Minot, or whatever it is. And then there's me. And uh, did I ever tell you that, that, that I got dental x-rays in an email? More than <laughs> once? Jeez. Same patient? From the same people? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an email, and they're like, "Here, here's the X-rays you requested. You know, please let us know what you think." And I'm like, "Hey, homeboy, I don't know what you think." I, I wrote back. I, I hit reply, hashtag HIPAA, send. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kinder to me because I was. Uh, yes, these all require extraction. <laughs> <laughs> As soon oh, as possible, Mister. I want to put you in, in. Maybe they just moved up from Mar from uh, from, from shipping. shipping. That's right. <laughs> maybe they were mopping the floors yesterday, and they don't know uh, not to send Paul Markle, the gun writer, teeth X rays. You don't know now. Well, <laughs> that's pretty funny. People like so. That. So when's this new book coming out? Boy, you know that's it's a hard thing because every time I work on it, I start crying. And yeah. Oh. I got to take a little break and uh, go outside and throw the ball for Gunner for a few minutes. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping sometime this, this next year. Okay. We'll see. Well, you know, we're we're beginning of this year. So, yeah. That's you right. know who wants we're a copy first, right first now? Quarter. Me. My wife. She'll oh. get a signed copy yeah. when it comes. Uh, you should have a proof of your manuscript. Uh. That's not. I think, you know, I'm going to be like you. And the next book's going to. My first two books were just horrors. That's H O R R O R S. Because I had a publisher um, who I kind of felt like screwed me out of some money, and that my 
why royalty statements don't include ebooks and audiobooks and so forth. What? Uh, what? That's, yeah. Oh, that's and crazy. Here's Mike going, well, do I spend my life savings trying to prove this guy has cheated me? Or do I move on? Yeah. Chalk it up to experience. Because uh, my life savings probably are not what you might expect. A handsome, well-dressed guy like me. This is, you know, and this is this is pre-social security. So, um, anyway, yeah, it's uh, people like, oh, did you sell the rights to the movie? And you know, did you do this and did you do that? And I'm like, no, you know, I got a twenty-five hundred dollar advance, not a bonus, an advance against I, I, sales. I asked for a ten thousand dollar advanced because it took me six months to write that book right which meant i wasn't writing for gun magazines mm. anymore i was just writing this book and the people at harris were very shirley and karen and harry were in linus were all very kind about it and did not send assignments oh there, there might have been one or two assignments but they 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 let me take it easy while i wrote that book because they knew it was important to me but uh yeah, so I got that $2,500 advance, Whew. and that was the last check I ever got. No. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm like, I'm what, about, what about Barnes & Noble? We sent them a bunch of books. Well, yeah, but after three months, they said they weren't selling, so they sent them back, and I'm like, well, how do I know that? And they're like, you just got to take our word for it. You know what are we supposed to do? Send you, show you the the, the shipping bill. And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, oh, that doesn't sound right. No, brother, it, it's the book. The for those of you who want to be writers, let me tell you something. Find another hobby. Well, well, <laughs> that's crazy, man. There's, don't. Yeah. There, there's two possibilities there. I'm they were lying. They didn't do their job marketing. Oh, they did. They did nothing for marketing. So. Uh, you did all the they, marketing. They, they you said did that's, all the hustling. That's that's for you. You've got to get out there and do that. And I'm like, well, gee, you know what they did do? Kindly enough, they scheduled they, things. They no, they they scheduled nothing. Uh, I thought, well, you know, can you get me on Hannity's show? Can you? All these people are talking about gun trafficking. Mm -hmm. And if the listeners don't know, uh, I was involved in Operation Wide Receiver, which was a precursor to Operation Fast and Furious, mm -hmm. where the ATF had me as a uh, uh, confidential source selling firearms out of my living room uh, to cartel sources. And uh, they had convinced me that they were going to take down some cartels by following these guns back to Mexico and then taking down a cartel, which sounds like part of that equation. There's something very big missing. Yeah. When you go back, you're like, it's, it's like the underpants gnomes, like it's exactly step one like that. steel underpants. Step three profit. Make well, them, make what, them, yeah. What's step two? You, you, don't, have, you they, don't need to know. They're like, step one, right. sell guns yeah. to the cartels. Step three, bring the cartels down. Yeah, but did, what, did, what's there's your plan in the there's middle there? Something, there's like, something missing. I don't, it'll work its and, way out. And as a source, you know, I'm like, listen, I, I was a criminal justice major in college, so I know a little bit pre-law stuff and uh, fruited poisonous tree. There's a fancy term mm -hmm. for you. I knew about stuff like this, and I also knew that our government couldn't go into Mexico and, and access bank accounts to take these cartels out of business. So I'm thinking, these guys got some kind of elaborate plan here in the United States where they're going to be able to go after mansions and cars and bank accounts up here, maybe. I don't know. But the deeper I got into it, what was supposed to be a three-week operation ended up being a three-year operation. Um, at the end of three years, nothing more made sense. Nothing started making sense till Brian Terry, the border patrol agent who got shot with a fast and furious gun mm -hmm. stuff started coming out in the paper. And I would look at these articles and try to gather as much information as I could. And then looking back at the diary, I kept the three years I was working with them was able to go, Oh, that's what that was all about. That's why they had me do this or why they had me do that. That's why this guy disappeared. He got assassinated down in Hermosillo. Okay, now now stuff's starting to make sense. I didn't get that information 
from the people I was working with who knew very well what had happened. Yeah. And you would think, oh, remember that guy in your house that you almost shot the bodyguard? Well, he's the one that killed that other, the little guy that was in your house with a 10 millimeter down in the city square in Hermosillo. You would think they would tell me that, but no, they didn't. Well, why would you need to know? So anyway, anyway, so for your listeners, the first book was called Guns Across the Border, and then they they renamed it Operation Wide Receiver, which was the true uh, code name for for this supposed investigation in paperback. And uh, like I said, it was my three year ordeal working with ATF agents and cartel members, and. Uh, um, originally was not going to do anything with it until Brian Terry got killed. And, and I felt so terrible for his family and what they went through and seeing them hitting the same stone wall I was hitting about getting information. Well, how could this be? How could it be that our government's letting guns go across? the border? Oh no, we didn't let any guns go across the border. And that's when I knew there was a cover up because mm. these agents I worked with would tell me, Absolutely. Night after night, yeah, we followed him to the border and watched him go across. So absolutely they did know, and absolutely they did know it was. The word investigation is not correct for this. It was not a, a, a operation might fit, um, but the, the, the whole intent of Fast and Furious and Operation Wide Receiver was to put as many guns as they could in Mexico so they would show up at crime scenes. And then they could come back here in the United States and go, look what these American guns are doing to these poor Mexicans. We need to do some kind of more gun control. Need we, more need gun assault, control. we need these assault weapons banned back. And in fact, Eric Holder said it the first, very first month of President Obama's uh, uh, presidency. Says, uh, he said something to the effect, not, not a direct quote. In regards to gun control, things are pretty good, but we do need to reestablish the assault weapons ban because innocent Mexicans are dying at the hands of American guns. So, and you're like, ding, 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 ding. Did you get a, a photograph of all of us? I haven't yet, but I will. And uh, before I do that, I want to mention that. Should we, I put my shirt on? No, you can leave it off, and I'll <laughs> leave my heels on. Okay. Um, so April 13th, 2015, we had, uh, man, that was eight years ago. Wow. That was, that was when we had you on to talk yeah, about yeah. operation wide receiver. I think you were, you were, uh, guesting on Tom's show, right? Tom Gresham. I did. I did guest yeah. host Tom's show. Yeah. Did I have you on? You, you had me on as a guest. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. Oh my gosh. Jeez. That's right. Yeah. Thanks Tom. Yeah. Crazy. So you can listen to more about operation wide receiver, obviously pick up the book and read it because it's an incredible story. And not, even though that you're listening to Mike Deddy right now talk and you were reading the, when you read the book, you're going to be like, is you're gonna, afraid for him. Is he going to die? I, I read the book and I was like, man, I hope Mike gets out of this. Yeah. yeah. I, hope so he, just, and, and I hope he can get out of this. When, when I published that, the publisher said, you know, you talk a lot about your dogs in the book. Do you have any picture of your dog? So I sent him like 30 pictures of dog pictures. They printed <laughs> Every last dog picture I sent him. So you got to go, is this a, you know, care of the common canine or, <laughs> you know, what kind of book is this? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that I thought the book turned out well. And, uh, of course my friends are biased, you know, they're reading it not because they care much about cartels or drug trafficking or guns or anything other than I was involved. That's why most of my friends read it. Um, <sighs> I'm not sure anybody in my family has actually read it cover to cover. My sister told me, she said, you know, all those Hispanic names get mixed up and around and I have a hard time keeping track. So, okay. <sighs> Como? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody might, you know, for a while, I think my mom really thought that I had done something wrong and this was how I was trying to get out of it. Oh, and I had, I had a, you know, cause when you talk about going to work for the government and you're not an agent, I'm not an agent. I'm a confidential source or informant. Yeah, you're, I, you're I was, a disposable I, asset. I was I was told by another federal agent. He says, don't, don't ever say you're a confidential informant. He says, say confidential source. It makes you sound better. So, okay. Okay. That Thank you. Sense. Yeah. Thank you. Now I feel better about myself. But um, 
usually those people that find themselves in that spot to help the government are helping themselves get out of a jail sentence. Yeah, get, get out of and, trouble. Yeah. Uh, 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 and maybe something like well, uh, yeah, the as, witness protection program yeah, as, is offered as, to them. To anybody who's a town. cop is like, a CI is a snitch. Yeah. And the, the reason they're a CI is because they're, we made it, we played, let's make a deal with them. They're not, they're not stand up citizens like my friend Mike Daddy is. And you know what? You, you know how, how their day is ruined when a snitch gets killed? It does not. They could care less. They could be, care less. Because it's one less scoundrel in, yeah. this, in this world. They don't care. I was a little bit different that, you know, I brought this information. I said, you know, this guy was a customer at a gun show and I think he's up to some stuff. And I thought I'd lay it in your lap and walk away. And uh, instead they said, hey, uh, how'd you like to help You're us? You're a patriotic American citizen. You want to help your government? Exactly. Slapping on the back. Oh, you're a Marine? Oh, yeah. You got a flag in front great. yard? Oh, oh you got no family? Perfect. Yeah. So that's why I was selling guns out in my living room. And uh, is anybody going to talk about the massive cojones on Mike Deddy right now? Oh. <laughs> he actually can't close his legs because his huevos are so grande. It's so huge. Oh. It's so grande. Because he lives in the same house. Yeah, you know, they. I never got the reward money to move, so <laughs> I'm in the same. They stiffed him out of the reward money. In the same uh, freaking right, house. You, you know how to self-publish and make your own money, right? <sighs> That's something I need to talk to you about. We got you. We got you. We will help you. We got you, homeboy. Now, uh, those of you that go buy the book, Operation Wide Receiver, buy the physical copy. Do it not buy the e-copy. He won't get any money. Do not anyway. buy, <laughs> buy the audio book. Buy the physical book. Go to Go to Amazon. By the way, uh, almost a year ago, my FedEx driver knocked on the door. He had a package for me. He, he goes, Mike Duddy, he goes, you know, I know your name. He goes, did you know that Joe Rogan and Ted Nugent were talking about you on Joe's show the other day? And I'm like, you're kidding me. He goes, absolutely not. He says, uh, Nugent, he couldn't think of your name right away, but the, the producer put up a picture of your book cover on a thing. Oh, so he did. He, he did. Oh, and good, good. he's like, you know, if you don't think our government is up to something rotten, go read Mike's book. He'll fill you in on what the government will do to you. And then how they're going to expose you when you don't become Mm, uh, when, compliant when they're or, done with you, yeah, they, yeah. yeah, you you become a a tissue. Yeah. So, so episode one hundred and fifty three of Student of the Gun Radio, you can go listen to all 153? about one hundred and fifty three. That's oh, all it was. Three there? digits, not four. Oh, we're we're on. I probably 1, sound 000. a lot younger there. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what are we on now? <laughs> one thousand one hundred and was it one? Is it eleven eighty nine? Eleven ninety? Something like that. <laughs> We're doing the consummate podcast thing. Where this is what you hear the guys who do podcasts. You hear them doing stuff like this. They're like, we're, we're uh, Chris Jericho and and Rogan used to be Rogan. He doesn't do it anymore. But we we grabbed all our stuff. We're in a hotel room, and I've got grabbed everybody up, and we're gonna do it. But we actually are in a hotel room. And I've got Michael Bain, my old friend, Michael Bain. Thank you for joining us, Michael. It is wonderful to spend any amount of time with you. Uh, we've, we've known each other for quite a while. I'm going to tell a story about Michael Bain. So many, many years ago, um, when I decided I wanted to be a TV star, which is it's one of those things. I don't know if I decided that. It just kind of fell in my lap. But uh, I worked very diligently on it. I, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I knew I knew how to write. And I knew I knew how to teach. And I didn't realize that when I was sitting down that I was producing the show. That that's what they call it in the biz. I thought, well, we're going to go through all these segments. I'm going to tell you which one to do and where to stop and where to cut and where to pick up. And, I had, and the guy leaned over. He goes, because that's, that's what we call producing the show. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. See? And I didn't even get a producer credit. So I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? But uh, the day the show launched... I got a, a text on, I think I had a, a flip phone back then. I might have had a Motorola StarTac. <laughs> back in the day, man. I might have had a Motorola StarTac. You're like, you didn't get a text on a Motorola StarTac. You Shut up and quit lying. don't even know what that is because I don't know what yeah. that is. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a text from this man right here. And he said, congratulations on your new show. And of all the 
Are we going to put this in the public one? Yeah, or public. The, oh, okay. Then we I might split it. Of, of all the of all the mother lovers that I knew <laughs> in the business, this one, this mother lover was the first, was the only one that day that the show launched to say congratulations. And I've I've remembered that for a long time, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Paul. But and I remember that you did a good job, and it's hard to do a good job on television. I mean, w- things that we've done you know, where we've been on television, we've been on, on radio, we've been in podcast. It, it, at some point to us, it becomes second nature. It, it becomes something that we're able to do because uh, the same is with training. The same is with shooting skills. It's, it's uh, straight out repetition. You do it over and over and over again. It gets easier and easier and easier, but you always have to remember that first time, I mean, the first time that, that it's on you mm. and the first time that the red light goes off on the camera and it's you, if someone screws up, dude, it is you and they will hunt you down like a dog. Oh yeah. But you did a good job. Well, th- I appreciate that. I really, I really do. And, uh, I was also going to say, uh, we had this conversation a long time ago. We actually had it out here in Arizona, uh, where we are right now. Uh, raise your hand. If you've ever received a rainbow colored check with Larry Flint's signature on it. Okay. My hands up. <laughs> My hands up. <laughs> I am excluded. Uh, there's two people in this room. And for the uh, for the for those of our age, they're like, oh, I, I get that. And those the, the Gen Zs are like, who's Larry Flint? Anybody that's been go, in go New Orleans Google. knows who Larry Flint go is. Go Google him. Go well, Google him. Because the thing was, is, is when you're a writer, when you're a professional writer, and I was mm. a professional writer a long time before television, Oh yeah, and I, you lived in New York City. You're a professional writer, and what you do is you pedal your ass like like a five dollar uh, street girl. Someone has to give me money, and invariably, uh, and and maybe I shouldn't say this, but back in the day, the magazines that gave you the most money had largely undressed women in them. Well, that's how Harris started. Yes, Harris started with skin mags. Nobody wants to talk about that. The cat, the, the people who buy cat fancy and dog fancy <laughs> and golf aficionado or golf today or whatever, they don't want to. They don't want to know that the dude who owns that magazine made his his dough with skin. And it's true. You and and you would you know in New York City you would want to have prestige titles. You'd want you know I wrote some stuff for Rolling Stone. I wrote some stuff for for um, the Village Voice, prestige publications. And, and they paid you basically, you know, a sack of dog food and 20 mm. bucks. And then you'd get a call from one of the magazines that was cheesy, and they would say, we'll give you 2,000 bucks. And you're like, oh, my God, I might be able to pay the mortgage. Might be able might to pay, be the, pay rent. the rent. Yeah. You know, holy <laughs> cow. And then plus they were willing to um, uh, they were willing to give you money to do what I almost think of as breathtakingly stupid stuff. Um, I, I actually went on the road for Mr. Flint's magazine. I, I went on the road with David Allen Coe. Oh, no way. <laughs> oh, you got oh, some look, stories. All right, Gen Z's, go Google that. Oh, go yeah. Google, go David, Google Allen Allen David Allen Coe. David Allen Coe. We uh, actually, this A quiet John, reserved gentleman. Oh, God. Along the lines of he, John Denver. He, yeah. uh, I'm on the road with him, and and we're playing Tonks in Texas, and we're playing chicken wire bars, and they exist where there's chicken wire in front of the stage. Go watch the Blues Brothers. Yeah, people are throwing stuff, and it's like crazy times. And I'm there with David. The bar is full of bikers. It's all Patch Brothers. And, you know, so it's halfway between a, a, a riot and a show, and David's slamming stuff up. And I swear, as God is my witness, this is true, the bar caught on fire. Oh my! Somebody knocked over something—a oh candle gosh. or something—and we saw a little bit of fire on the wall, you know. And everybody's running and screaming. And David looks Jesus at me and he on. goes, "You want to go sit on the roof?" I said, "Yeah, what the hell? We're in a burning honky yeah. tonk. Let's go sit on the roof." And so we got two folding chairs. We went up to the roof and we're sitting on the roof, and smoke is coming up the side. And David goes, "You think we're going to burn up?" I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm pretty sure this is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life today. Uh, but it is exhilarating. That, they came with a, a cherry picker, and they picked David and I off the roof. And we, we get down there, and there's all these biker guys, and they're coming up to me going like, we thought you was a pussy, but you know what? You're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of the story of Hunter S. Thompson going on the road with, with the Hells Angels. Yeah. 
Did you know Thompson? Did you met? I did. did you ma- meet him uh, at a Rolling Stone party in New York City? And and by then he was he was God or close to it. And uh, <laughs> I I actually did I tell you my story? Don't tell me. I'm you'll not- you'll appre- as someone who knew him like more than casually, you'll appreciate this. So in '93, I got a job with a a security company in Aspen. And uh, those who know, there's a there was a bodyguard company that was started in Aspen about 50 years ago. Oh my gosh, <laughs> 45 years ago. You were 11. Just you know, uh, you know, anyway, so I was working for that company, and at the time, uh, Lyle Lovett was a BFD, right? Like, right, and right. He, Lyle Lovett in his large band, and he had just married Julia Roberts. And she was on fire because she did she did a uh, pretty woman sleeping with the enemy, and so her star was on the rise, right? So they hired us basically just to do backstage tour bus area, keep the idiots away, right? And it was it was a typical thing uh, for back security. We I went I was the head guy, and I had four guys with me. We all had radios. I went and met the stage director manager. And he handed me the clipboard, and he's like, okay, the people whose names are on this clipboard are allowed to come in the backstage door, right? So true. And, uh, and, and, he's, and he's like, nobody whose name's not on the clipboard gets in the backstage door. That's the end of that story. Make sure nobody gets by the tour buses. Julia Roberts wasn't there, right? She was off filming a movie somewhere, but the fan base, they're like, oh, I love it's here. And, and, then, and you know whose name was on the list? Mr. John Denver was on the list. And I actually had met John Denver about a couple months earlier. Uh, just met him. You know, people, I was at a place, and they're like, this is John Denver. And I was like, and he's like, oh, hi, really nice to meet you. And he was, he had a beard. He was That was when he had the full beard. He yeah. didn't look like the guy from the Muppet Show, you know. Um, so Denver shows up, walks up to the back door. My guy says, oh, good evening. Boom, John Denver and guest. Right in, you go, right? So I'm walking around, time's going by. And my my buddy, and the, keep in mind, this is 93. I've only been out of the Marine Corps for like a year or two. <laughs> I'm still pretty Marine Corps tight. And uh, and I've been, you know, in the infantry, so I don't pay attention a lot to pop culture. Well, my the guy at the back door, I'm, I'm walking around checking posts, and he goes, hey, you need to come back here. He goes, we got a situation. I'm like, what? He goes, just, just come over here I'm like all right so i hustle over there and there's this really tall guy with a woman with really big boobs standing off to the side vi- crossed armed very annoyed and i'm like what's the deal and he goes he said he's supposed to be allowed in i said who's he he goes he says his name is hunter s thompson <laughs> and i said is he on the list and he's like no i said then he don't get in right and so he's like, oh, he's like red. He's mad. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> any, go see who's at the door. There's somebody at the door. Uh, so, any hooser. Ah, it's Uncle Dave. I'm Uncle tell- Dave. I'm, tell- Uncle Dave. I'm telling a story. Uncle Dave's here. He's, he's interrupting our, our recording, but that's okay because we no, love him anyway. That's okay because we can edit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, I'm, like, I'm like, hang on a second. I said, just stay right here. So I go hustling into the venue because the concert's going and everything. I go hustling into the venue, and I find the stage director, the manager. And I was like, hey, there's a dude back there who's just all PO'd because he thinks he should be allowed. And he goes, well, who is it? I said, he said his name's Hunter S. Thompson. And he's like, oh, jeez. <laughs> he's like, all right, come on. And so we walk to the back and he's like, Hunter, come, come on. And, and, he, and he looks at me and he goes, and he gives me the, you, you did the right thing. You know, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't on the list. And so he didn't. So that was my brush with fame with Hunter S. Thompson. It was, I mean, those were great days. It's, it's just, um, yeah, I wrote, uh, I was editor of country music magazine. I wrote a lot about, about uh, music in the kind of the outlaw era of the seventies. Mm. And the first time I went Willie Nelson, I, I, I literally flew down is, is right before redheaded stranger became huge hit. Right. And uh, I went up to the, the door of his bus and knocked on the door of his bus. And he goes, and who the F are you? I said, I'm a rock critic from New York. And he goes, what do you want? I said, I'd like to go on the road with you. Do you have a bag? 
I said, yeah. He goes, get on the bus. And so I, I, I went on the, the, the state fair circuit with Willie Nelson and um, Tommy Lee Jones occasionally and Chris Christopherson. And the great thing was that if you were on the bus, you must be somebody. You got to be. Hell, you, you were on the bus. You've been approved. That's right, yeah. Yeah, you've been vetted. I would never say this is true. This is an outright lie. I, I, this is just something I made up. But it conceivably is my job is, is that one day the road manager said, if I said the word 1911, is there any chance you would know what I meant? As it happens. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, prove it. Opens his briefcase in 1911. Sure. Did, did, do this, put it back, set on the table. He goes, son of a gun, load that mother up and let's go get the gate. So I, was, I loaded up the 1911, <laughs> stuck it in my <laughs> pants, and went and got a grocery sack of cash, which is why Willie Nelson got nailed by the IRS. But you come back with a grocery sack of pants and, uh, of money of cash, in 45, yeah. and you're like, Protecting cool. the gate. You know? Protecting the gate. <laughs> That's a cool sales. story, bro. As, 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 uh, <laughs> it was a great time, you know. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, I went I was on the road with the Allman Brothers, uh, on the road with Waylon Jennings, Hank Jr. I wrote Hank Jr.'s autobiography and the subsequent TV Dave, movie. Dave knows the he knows the Hunter Thompson story. Yeah. 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 Hunter, I mean, I just does the only Dave, reason does I Dave got, want to sit down in this and talk down. into this microphone right here. You can. You can. Michael is being and I are being joined by the illustrious David Biggers. Uh, Dave Biggers of the the Dave Biggers Experience fame. You got to put your face closer to the thing if you want people to hear you. I'm loud. So, uh, what in the F and F did you do to your noggin? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not. Funny. Don't don't say swears because we're probably going to do this on on okay. public on the family friendly thing. I can you tell us what you did funny, to your head without swearing? Funny story. Oh, okay, funny well, story. I'm gonna, I'm there I was. My, I'm going to do my best. There I was. I, I will cut to the chase. I was carrying a ruck. Mm -hmm. getting a workout in, and I wound up nosediving and doing a head plant. But the only part that makes this a good story is I really did get right up, and I'm checking. It's like, okay, what the hell's going on? Sorry. Check my head, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, I got a little blood. I took a picture to try to see how bad it was. And I really couldn't tell. Didn't have my reading glasses. He's now selling those, by the way. Autographed. It's, it's a head wound, so it starts bleeding, bleeding like copiously. crazy. And all I've got is a windbreaker, so nothing's getting <gasps> mopped up. And uh, so I get up, and I I know you. I, know, I wish you I knew know, someone who sold pocket medical kits. I know. And you know what? I'm actually going to post that on Facebook, going, "Don't do what I did," because I felt <laughs> like an absolute idiot. The uh, anyway. So the a lady sees me and there's blood everywhere, and she's like, "Oh my God, you know, you need an ambulance." And I'm like, "I really don't need an ambulance." But then I started thinking, I, I'm like, "Can you tell me what this looks like?" Because I can't tell, you know. And if it's really, really bad and it's not just skin stitches, then yeah, I probably need to look at something. And if she hadn't been so nice, it was a nice lady and her family. If she hadn't been so nice, I would have told her to go away and mm -hmm. leave me alone. Because I'm walking back to my car. I'm about two and a half, three miles from my vehicle. And uh, so the paramedics show, they slap a piece of gauze on there, and they start wrapping my head. And then the guy's like, well, here, let's get that off of you. And so and I'm taking the ruck off. He almost drops it. And he goes, oh, my God, what do you got in this thing? And I said, eh, about 50 pounds of lead weight. And he stops and he looks at me and he goes, how old are you? And I'm like, <laughs> 64. <laughs> He's like, you were in the military, weren't you? Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah. And then he looks at the other guy like, this kind of stuff happens. This happens. But yeah, nine stitches. Nine stitches. Nine stitches. And I did. I wasn't going to let the ambulance go, and they really aggravated me because they're, they're checking for concussion. Mm -hmm. and it's like, I don't have a concussion. I've had four of them. I know, well, you know, what's your, do you know what day it is? And I'm like, so here's the day. Here's, here's the day of the month. Here's my home address, including my zip code. Here's my previous address in New Hampshire. And here's the other previous address in Washington. Here's where he failed. They asked him for the lead singer of Depeche Mode. I'd have been done. <laughs> I'd have been done. My own personal. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. All right, I have a hunting story with him. Uh, a Dave Biggers hunt. Was it a hog hunting story where he left me behind? Oh, this is a hog hunting story where the pig snuck up on Dave. 
We're like we're he, this, he wasn't he wasn't in the middle of, of vague va- voiding his bladder, was he? I thought no. we were I thought we weren't telling no, the story. He was like riveted, looking forward, looking for hogs. And I look behind me and there's this hog and he keeps getting closer. And he looks he like a cute right puppy. Uh-huh. He cock his head like a little puppy yes. and he would look at us and be like Dave. Dave. I'm like, Dave, Dave. And the, the hog gets a little closer. Dave, Dave, behind me. And Dave's like, whoa. And then the pig goes like, you guys are cool. And he, and he literally walks past Dave, who leans over and goes like, blam. <laughs> I had to take him out of the gene pool. He was, was not, he was not helping his were, were you in a blind or a? No, uh, no, we were, were in a different a place. We're in a place we really, there are certain places in Texas that are weird Beyond anywhere else that you can be except Texas, but there, but a movie. Yes, a movie I had this great of- idea for like a B movie with because we're in this place with all these hogs and high fence. Some fences you can't climb. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine red eyed. Sa- I don't know if you saw it. it was, there it was, were skulls <laughs> and chunks vultures. of hide and bones all over this place. It was like a haunted movie thing. It was. It really was. And it was just like, you know, the whole time you're there, you're thinking like, this may be the weirdest place I've ever been in the entire world. <laughs> it was It was not hunting. It was ballistic And there's all testing. these like weird animals walking around like well, a water thing, buffalo. The thing with, with uh, we had a water We had a water high buffalo fit. walk up behind us. <laughs> yes. Well, you've been, you've been, you know how hogs view fences. They're like, we're not climbing yeah, it. We're going under. Right. Yeah, we're, we're going one, under This that. one, they're not getting under. Yeah. This is like... A berry fence? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like he said, you're not getting out. <laughs> yeah. You're not getting out. <laughs> you're not getting And the movie, out. I mean, it'll, it'll be a hit. Oh, if yeah, you ever saw the Australian movie, which is a real favorite of mine, it's a movie called Razor Black back and it was could arguably the best film ever made on a giant man eating hog. Yeah. Ah. And I want to do that. There's, com- there's a lot of competition in that. I, I'm in not that seeing venue. that one. I'm pretty sure there's an Academy Award for hog movies and I'm pretty sure I can I want to just get on stage and Dude, slap I, the crap I, out of somebody. I, I, I'm going to admit something to you guys. I haven't been I haven't killed a hog in Texas in almost 10 years. And I feel really bad about that. How long has it been since we killed a hog in Texas, Jared? That's wrong. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe not then, like 13, 14. Wait, that, years they it? miss you. They probably, they're probably way overpopulated because I haven't been there in a they, while. No, they, yeah, they kept yeah. bringing up trucks with more while we were there. <laughs> well, they're the best. Here's Not even joking. Uh, well, talk about not even joking. Um, <laughs> people don't understand the value or right, what Cortez, was Cortez, right? Right. Yeah, Cortez yep. did us a huge favor. Yes. That is protein. Yep. That is rapidly multiplying protein. Yes, it is. So when the when the Soros crew and the and the the leftists, when they try and convince you that you need that when the people in Denver are lining up for their cricket rations yep. and stuff, you know, the the people in, in Chicago and New York are lining up for their soy cricket, you know, mix paste. Oh yeah. Uh, soylent green. Yeah, they're soylent green. The people in Texas, if you know how to do it, th- there's meat on the hoof right there, it, man. It's funny. And there's protein on the hoof. Several years ago, they had DeSoto is one of the suburbs of Dallas, and a rather ritzy <laughs> suburb of Dallas. And they did this news report, and they're like, oh, my God, it's horrible. The, you know, and here's these these poor people with their extremely expensive cars and their you know $2 million houses, and they're like, these, these feral pigs are coming in. They're just tearing everything up, and there's nothing we can, can do, do to stop and them. And we're like, au contraire. I, well, <laughs> they it, did the same thing in New Orleans. Yeah. In, in, uh, in what, What's the city at East New Orleans, East New Orleans, New Orleans East or whatever it's called? And they're like, they, they, they interview people like, we don't know what to do. They're running through our yards. And I'm like, you don't know what to do? <laughs> But that's like, I mean, you look at Rocky Mountain National Park, right? I live, I live near Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. And uh, they had like so many elk that the elk were literally eating all the aspen. I mean, they were just destroying yep. aspen groves. And so they said, we got to take X hunter to elk. And we're like, ah, excuse me. Hi. Hello. Uh, we're here. We're here. We can do this. They ended up hiring 
hunters, not hunters, uh, they hired guys with suppressed rifles and helicopters to shoot them because the outcry for giving permits to hunt the elk was so large that they said, okay, we'll have these guys come in, uh, night vision, everything, and just smack them at night and then just leave them on the ground. It's like, well, no, it's protein. Yeah, you don't leave crazy. protein you on don't the ground. Waste it. You don't, no, you know? that's there are in fact shelters and things. There are people who you know haven't seen protein in a long time. That's that's to me is crazy. That's, well, that's a criminal society that we live in. Is people are so up their own rectums that they they can't see that. It's like I I I, I was joking. I said, man, they should have uh, when they just they just whacked that zebra <laughs> in, in Ohio. I said, my my question is, did they make zebra steaks or not? And somebody's like, you don't want to eat a zebra. I'm like, okay, hang on a second. That is grass-fed protein. And, I, and, and there are a lot of people in, in Africa who would debate that with me. Oh, yeah. You know, I've had zebra <laughs> chili, and it's excellent. I've, I, quick zebra. Like, uh, I, I smacked this zebra in Africa, right? And the rug is in my office, right? And so I bought a can new couch. Me? I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Good. Okay. And these guys who they give me furniture before, so the guy who – Owned the company, came and helped with the delivery of the couch and a couple of chairs, right, in my office. And he walks into my office and he goes, oh, my dear Lord. He goes, that is an amazing rug. That is just amazing. I said, thank you. He goes, you know, we sold zebra rugs and we had to stop because none of them look like that. He goes, how'd you get it? I said, a 300 wind mag at about 125 yards. And he goes, dear Lord, you killed it? I said, did you think your zebra rugs committed suicide? How do you think they got <laughs> to be zebra apparently rugs? They were, apparently, they were roadkill, yeah. and that's why his didn't look that <laughs> He goes, I, I can't be in this room with death. I'm like, oh, like, death are you says serious? Bye. Death yes, is bad. You're, you're, oh, in a death, you're in a death world, bro. Dude. Bro, bro. Yeah. It's like, did you think he was going to give up his skin uh, voluntarily? Well, yeah. Thank and you, you, know. you don't think he was going to give up his skin voluntarily? Yeah, you, you shave it, and you get super glue, and then oh, you, man. You, know, you put all the... Z- zebras together. are mean zebras are mean they are and you know it's, it's funny because when that when that happened i don't know if you saw i mean you saw yeah i saw part. where the zebra bit the guy's and, and, arm and the off. guy bit the cool. freaking guy they, oh dude in yeah, ohio dude a, a zebra bit a dude's arm off o f f isn't that cool oh, and the God. deputies tourniqueted him so that's wow. even cooler so it was a tourniquet save and but then they're debating wow. about what they're going to do, and uh, they ended up. Meanwhile, and, this thing's roaming around. This thing's roaming around. And it's yeah. like, I'm all, and it they're was trying to figure out. Yeah. Bloody mouth. It, or, it, it was. It next. had the taste of human blood, and it was ready to yeah. go. But it looks so majestic and I, beautiful. Oh, I got to ask on on an interview. They said you shot a zebra. I said yeah. And they said that's just like shooting a polo pony. I said health is a polo pony. I'd have shot it first up. I think it's a terrible sport for rich people. Just smack the polo pony. And he's like, let's cut to a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And, but do you know, if it, if it would have been killed in Africa, if there were about a half hour later, there'd been nothing but sure. a red spot on sure. the ground. Yeah. They don't leave. They don't leave protein on the ground. Nope. No. And, and again, I mean, I, I had a bunch of zebra chili and, and that, you know, I thought it was great. You know, it's 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 like people don't like elk. There's people like, oh, it's too gamey. I don't people like. If you don't like elk, elk and oh, you're listening to this, I I've had, give I've you had my address. Like, oh, I don't, I don't like elk. It's too gamey. And it's like, well, you can do. You know, it. It's called preparation. Well, then don't shoot and, them. And you're well. You know, they're like, oh, somebody offered me someone was like, I don't want it. I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll take it. Yeah, here's my number. Yeah, call me. Yeah, the the the, the protein value of elk is insane. Like the, the, as far as, you know, it's meat very value. Meat, yeah. You know, it's not only that you were talking about it earlier. You kept saying grass fed. That's like, as far as that is the purest far, thing. No, any, no any wild, any wild game. Yeah. Ticks all those boxes. Yep. Check, check, check. Well, you know, ironically in, in, you but know, they're in, causing global warming. Oh, when, you know I'm, when I'm, when I'm close, I live close <laughs> to Boulder County and there's a whole lot of local vores who like basically very, very super liberal progressive people who are like, the only way I can get non-antibiotic protein is shoot it. Yeah, no local kidding. Four. That's a new word. I've never heard that one before. Yeah, local war. I, I like we, that. We only eat stuff that's from with like a hundred yards of us. <laughs> well, maybe a little farther. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so here's the deal. We're gonna we got to go to dinner. We do. Yes, we, we do. do. Uh, we and uh, we'll be a local war. It's yeah, like we'll be local war. Did it yeah. come from within okay. a half mile of the restaurant? And they're like. 
No, man. You know, it came frozen from New Zealand. <laughs> for, yeah, from, uh, yeah, not for very much longer. But, yeah. but Uncle Dave is, uh, Jared's Uncle Dave is guy. I'm sure he has wonderful accommodations for us for dinner. We're looking forward to that. So The Subway, it's it's really lovely. It's, it's, you can order any <laughs> sandwich you want. You can get a protein bowl. Did you know that you can get protein bowls at Subway? Yeah, I learned that today. What kind I was, of protein? Today Let's level your it. zebra. It's Arizona, <laughs> it's Arizona Max. Arizona it, it Max. Good. You will enjoy it. All right. Well, I have some questions for uh, Mr. Bain here, but we'll get those another Wait, day. Yes, no, I, and an unsmiling Shetland pony. That's right, yeah. Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut question. An unsmiling wait, wait, one. Wait, wait, one glass story. I edited an article by Kurt Vonnegut, a review of a Statler Brothers country music concert when I was editor of country music, and the phone rings. It's Kurt Vonnegut. It's like Kurt Vonnegut. And Kurt Vonnegut's, how was my article? <laughs> Gee, Mr. Vonnegut. It was really good. And he goes, you miserable little F. He goes, what the F do you F and think F and editors do? They F and edit. Now edit, you F and p- <laughs> I don't you think you say that one either. you were worried about my language. <laughs> well, I, I cut the F and, but I said, okay, Mr. Vonnegut, let's start in the first paragraph and work say, through all right. this. Yeah. Oh. Well, remember this. And, and uh, my, my dear departed friend, uh, Jay Guthrie, said this. Uh, when I found I out he was dude. he was editing my stuff, uh, you weren't there for that. Since when did pusillanimous become a bad pusillanimous? Word? That's right, like pusillanimous. That. Don't be Seriously. so pusillanimous. He said. <laughs> he said. Even Hemingway had an editor. Uh, that's that's true. true. Even Hemingway had an editor. And what's funny is he said that to me, and it calmed me down a little bit. And uh, then a couple of years later, I was on the phone with him, and I said. Uh, I said, I remember when you said that. I said, I remember, you know, I said, I, I keep that piece of advice in my pocket. And he's like, dude, he said, I totally stole that from one of my professors. But <laughs> but that, I'm, that I'm, I'm glad went, that you had it. That guy went too young. Oh, yeah. That was, it was, it hurt my heart. Yeah, mine it hurt too. My heart. I, had, I didn't, I didn't had, know the guy that long, yeah. but it was just, I really I had, liked that. I thing. had brutal editors when I was in New York City. Mm -hmm. Just awful people. And you know what? They made me a better writer. Absolutely. They made me better. Yeah. They didn't trigger See, that, you at all? That you weren't just a little bit triggered. I, uh, well, a couple of times I, I wanted to punch them, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they were right. No, they were exactly. right. Yeah. I was yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't didn't I write a, a story called "The Death of the Editor"? Yeah, yeah. Because if people don't they don't understand anymore. No. That's how you learned how to be a writer. Was what do by you being know about corrected, writing, though? By being corrected by a professional, and 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 my like my editor in New York. Did you ever meet Harry Kane? By the way, oh, and, and I have many Harry Kane stories. Ha Harry Kane, he was like the J. Jonah Jameson yeah. of of gun of gun magazine editor. He's like Parker, I don't have time for your crap, you know. Boom, and it, he would. Damn, we're running out of time. But three minutes. He would call, like, and this is then back in the days of of, of uh, answering machines. I'd be out. I'd come back. Beep. Paul, oh, Terry Kane, give me a call. That was it. So I pick up the phone. I, there was a phone on a desk. It was attached to the wall. Imagine it. Close your what? eyes and imagine what? that. No. And crazy. I would pick it up, and I would call New York. And he's like, Harry Kane. Harry, this is Paul. Yeah, what do you need, Paul? Like, I'm returning your call. Oh, hang on. No, I already figured that out. Do you need anything else, Paul? No. All right, bye. Boom, click, done. Right. <laughs> I love going to his office when I go to New York City. After I moved, I'd walk in and say, "Hey, Harry," and he goes, "Too early for a drink? It's nine forty-five. And he not goes, for Harry. Cool, Kane let's go. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. So uh, and, I missed and, that. I missed and that a wrap. And all right, that was a wrap. We'll be back. I'm sorry. You know, Zach's gonna kill us. I know. Did Zach, we go over time? Oh, Zach needs this material. He's sitting at home waiting for us to deliver him this material. This is 1182. Right, right now. We're at 1182. Yeah. Sorry, Zach. <laughs> it's good we, stuff, though. Oh, it's fantastic stuff. Mr. Mike Deddy. This is, I'm shaking his hand uh, for those of you on the radio. That was uh, the hand? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Well, Stop. it had a mitten on it. <laughs> oh, man. Family friendly episode. I didn't say anything that wasn't right. family friendly. Thank you for, for being with us. We truly oh, appreciate man. it. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you again. Uh, and for uh, 